Yeah. I hate using microphones. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. No, yes and no. Okay. I'm going to use the microphone. Yeah. Okay. Everyone okay with this? All right. So, uh, Wolf said, My name is Roman Gomez. I am a young whippersnapper from the Rice Space Physics Department. <laughs> uh, this, I don't have a very long repertoire of history. So, this is me in my brief history. Uh, my first semester at Rice was in the fall of 2003. Uh, I got my master's in 2007 doing uh, IRDs, so space aptitude. And uh, that was dark matter search. Tom Hill was on my thesis committee at the time. Uh, after finishing that, I was looking for a new advisor. And thankfully, because of Tom and Pat's connections, I went off to the far off land of San Antonio and found someone by uh, the name of Dave Young, a former classmate, uh, who took me my thesis advisor. Uh, under him, uh, I started at Southwest Research as a graduate student, keeping my Rice affiliation. He became a uh, adjunct faculty at Rice. So that he, uh, I keep my affiliation with Rice. Uh, 2008, he said, well, you know, Roman, you, you seem to be working well, let's go ahead and make you a full-time employee. So I ended up working with Dave on the MMS project, and in a lot of, a significant part of my thesis work was working with the MMS instrument itself. Uh, in 2011, I came here and defended my PhD. Dave's remark was, congratulations, Dr. Gomez, and I'll get your butt back in the lab and let's get this thing out. <laughs> Thankfully, uh, five years later, uh, just last year, we delivered the last of the four flight units that we will be using in this mission. And uh, because of my involvement in the calibration process, I ended up getting put on the instrument science team. So, oops, so. Pardon me. Uh, let's go back one. So what we're looking at with this project is magnetic reconnection. When you've got the solar wind, about the, the magnetic field of the Earth, and the magnetic field lines are properly aligned, you can actually have some magnetic reconnection going on in that neo clock. But this is showing that occurs on both the day side and night side. So one thing that we're interested in looking at is energy. How frequent, how frequent these uh, events occur. And so, the best way to look at plasma is to go ahead and get a plasma instrument. Again, this is just a reiteration of little cartoons just showing how when these magnetic field lines from the sun and earth are properly aligned, you have magnetic reconnection to ions and electrons that are moving around these field lines, thusing they could be injected into the atmosphere, and then they're seeing things like aurora. So, our assumption is that plasma composition plays a role in magnetic reconnection. Magnetopause in the Earth, though, protons are a major species. At least 90% of the ions that you're getting from the plasma. So, this high proton concentration is going to be difficult. Uh, it's going to be difficult to see uh, species that are lower in concentration in those plasma. So, here at Rice, we pride ourselves in one thing, and we try to be clever. So, we talk about how we try to be clever. So, this is one of the ways. Top view is what the MMS HPCA instrument looks like. It is a top hat analyzer. So, you've got an, MF, uh, an ESA sitting on the inside. It's got a 360 degree field of view in one angle. The electrostatic analyzer allows us to scan plasmas and energies from one electron volt all the way up to 40,000 electrons. That is coupled to a thermal flight mass analyzer. And what we use that for, again, is to look at the composition of the plasma. And what you see, this part here that you see in the schematic is actually that top part, the pretty part, you know, the ugly part we put on the, on the spacecraft itself. But the nice part includes the thermal flight region and the ESA. Well, one of the things I, I told you what I participated in at Southwest Research is going through a very long, arduous calibration here. Uh, and that started off with calibrating the engineering model, the 
for my thesis work. And again, after getting my thesis work, they allowed me to go ahead and play with the flight instruments. And so, for the better part of two and a half years, I spent my time calibrating these flight instruments. This is a picture of our calibration system at, at uh, Southwest Research. We got the capacity flight, and we built it specifically for calibrating HECA. And we've got uh, three stages of motion. We can rotate the instrument about its long axis. We can pitch it so that we can measure the energy angle measurement, uh, energy angle response, and we can slide it back and forth so we can move it out of the beam and do other types of testing. On the bottom, we work in ion optics, so this is one of our lifesaver things that we can play with over there. Uh, we've got just the basic ion source, uh, but we have a complete up with a number of optics. We built an ion source, we plug holes in order to squeeze our ion beam. Got a beam filter so we can select our ion species so we can look at combined response versus species specific response. Uh, dual focusing, we've got a beam expander which takes the ion beam, the focused ion beam, at the other end of the second quadrupole triplet and extends the beam out to infinity and so on. So, swim uh, with a cylindrical configuration so we can fill the instrument aperture as much as possible to be able to make sure that we're getting a good characterization. One of the things that I ended up spending a lot of time on uh, was computerized simulations. When I first got to RISE, I'm sorry to say that I did not know how to computer code. So thanks to my former advisor, they overlap, Christopher Johns a couple of other people, they force fed me programming. So, you know, strict diet of C++ and IDL. Lo and behold, at the end, I ended up doing computer simulations. And this is where I have to agree with you. Yeah, I don't like to see things, uh, I don't like to see my theory deviate from my experimental results. So <laughs> it's always nice to be able to see that those things uh, match up. So again, we wanted to be able to cheaply estimate the transmission of the instrument and again, provide with these simulations a basis for comparison of test results. And lo and behold, we finished calibration. What we have here, the red line signifies the theoretical response in differential energy. Here, theoretical response in uh, azimuth angle. And you can see those things line up pretty well. The problem counting statistics here and there, but by and large, everything is working like it's working quite well. And this works with all four instruments. And uh, down here at the bottom, with these types of instruments, you your energy and angle response is intertwined. You cannot separate them. So you have to take the integration to integrate a response. And that's what's plotted down here and something we in the industry know as a cleaning plot. So I mentioned one part of being clever. Again, we've got this, we've got we're inundated with protons out there. How do you get rid of them? Jim Birch in uh, 2005, okay, my boss at Southwest Research and other rice alums, devised a means by using radio frequency voltage to basically velocity filter out specific species. And that's what we're doing here with protons. This is uh, the idea. The idea is if you can tune the radio frequency uh, voltage signal, you can catch protons before they get all the way through the ESS. If you're moving slower, you'll see more oscillation. So for instance, you're, you have an oxygen entering at the same energy. The oxygen is moving slower, so it sees more oscillations of the field, and therefore the path averages out. If you're moving faster than a proton, then you would see, not see a full oscillation, and you would also go through. So again, it's a velocity filter. You tune your radio frequency to the velocity of the species trying to obtain it. So what you see here, this is actually experimental results. This is what your acceptance space looks like when you do not have the radio frequency engaged. When you do have the radio frequency engaged, we can actually get an attenuation of proton systems up down to a, a thousand times. Uh, we, we generally use there we probably attenuated by about a factor of hundred, but we just want to make sure that we can get them down to almost zero. Uh, another thing about being clever, we use a a carbon foil time of flight mass spectrometer. And the problem about with carbon foils, whenever you're 
having uh, ions battle through a carbon foil, you're going to scatter these things at an angle and they're going to strike on energy. Now, there's really nothing you can do to correct for the energy. But for the angle, we have a series of 16 rings center. And the idea is we calculate a moment for each and every event. And we're able to take the correct forwarding angular scattering that would, it would occur, and we're able to shore up our, our mass resolution. And it's important because we have very short time of life reasons. And so we're going to end up introducing more error if we don't correct for the angle scattering. Um, this is just to show that we are able to, again, get very good results with so much light spectrum over three decades of energy at 312 dB. 3169 dB, 4200, sorry, 32,000 electron volts. And again, this is part of it. We take measurements of multiple energies. We go and we bin these things according to energy because, of course, if we're flying a space mission, we can't just down, uh, bring down every bit of telemetry that you have. You've got to kind of pick and choose, as you know. So what we do is we say, okay, if we've got and if we're scanning at energy of 100 electron volts, we should be able to say that everything that gets between these two points, uh, or these two or these bins, that would be hydrogen, everything that gets in these bins, it would be helium, so on and so forth. Again, we're just trying to be able to make sure that we can get good uh, fidelity of data with as little as possible. That all trade off. So current, currently the instruments are going through. Uh, well, actually, flight model one and two have already been put through their shaker, their shaker uh, phase, and they've already gone through thermal vac. We just finished thermal vac with the third instrument, and we're getting ready to go to the final one, you know, the final instrument on the August. That time we were supposed to be launching October of this year. Unfortunately, that's been pushed back to March of next year. But things are proceeding. Uh, Actually, quite well. And you know, attending regular time team meetings post launch, I have to remind myself that when we start getting ready to move closer to that time when we're launching, I have to make sure I drink plenty of coffee because it's going to be nice long hours in the commission. <laughs> okay, uh, acknowledge uh, Southwest Research Institute for allowing me to be a grad student there. Uh, Dave Young, Tom Hill, Pat Wright, Jim Burke, all instrumental in me being able to complete my degree and you know, find, find a place for at least young love to work. Uh, Rice University for taking on as a grad student, and my wife, Anna Gomez, for convincing me that it might be a good idea for me to present here as well. So uh, <laughs> let's see you in a bunch of There are still young guys who like to get out there and get their hands dirty with the experiment. Don't worry, things are still going on. <laughs>